the Wholeness Network. Awaken to the reality of wholeness. Eben Alexander, M.D., was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. He is the author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. On November 10, 2008, Eben Alexander was driven into a coma by a rare and mysterious illness. After seven days, and to the surprise of everyone, he awakened with memories of a fantastic odyssey deep into another realm, more real than this earthly one. His journey brings key insights to the mind-body discussion and to our human understanding of the fundamental nature of reality. So I have a story to tell you. Three years ago, yesterday, my mom passed away. Hmm. And probably a few, I'm not sure of the time, but before she died, she had read your book, Proof of Heaven. Mm -hmm. And one day I was visiting her. She was in a home for the last few years. And um, I was visiting her, and she said, you need to read this book, take it home, and read it, and then pass it on to your siblings. I want them to read it, too. So I, gosh, I'm going to get teary. (laughs) Um, I took it home. I never passed it on. Mm-hmm. And then when we were able to put this together, I found it. And I want you to know. So she was in the home, but I just wanted you to see her book. <laughs> oh. The cover is off. <laughs> she put her name on it. Now she was losing some of her, you know, by the end. Uh-huh. But as I just flipped through, look oh, at her. Oh, I love no. that. It's so beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, my gosh. I was she so is excited. totally into this. <laughs> Yes, oh, yes. I love this. That yes. is really sweet. Well, thanks for sharing that. Folding some of that back. Oh, that is really... Um, I love this one. She, she was reading this and remembered in a childhood dream, uh-huh. an angel with a, I don't know, with a pair, of, pair wings. of wings calling Sandra. That was her name. Oh, that is so she so was recalling beautiful. some of her... Oh, um, oh some of the, God, and it just so kind of just justified her experience. And, uh-huh. oh, so wow, I, love I love that. that. So this is now one of my... Precious gifts. Well, good. Well, thank. I love seeing proof of heaven like that. I've seen them with all these, you know, dog ears and yeah. little uh, markers and everything. So, but to see this, obviously, she got into it. She did. She did beautifully. Yeah. So that was just something that we didn't. I didn't put together when I we made our little arrangement here uh-huh. until just this week that it was well, the good. anniversary of, of her oh, passing. Well, that is so sweet. So well, thanks thrilled. for sharing that. Yeah, I'm thrilled about that yeah. experience. And she would be so excited about today. <laughs> well, I would say she is she excited is. about She's today. Here. She's and here. She's here. She hasn't left here. us. So yeah. that's beautiful for sure. What I love in the proof of heaven is the idea that vocabulary is so hard. That's something that I've loved using the word. The vocabulary isn't there for right. experiences that I've had. And, and so I really wanted to just talk about that for a minute. How has it been trying to put those those experiences into words? How has that been? Well, it, it's very challenging. And part of the, the issue is uh, that those realms can be... Uh, have their own rules. There are different ways that we know things. You don't, like in this world, we see with our eyes, we Mm -hmm. direct our attention to different things, we hear with the ears. And in those worlds, there's no such filtering mechanism. There's nothing that limits it. Right. And so our our contact with consciousness and with the realm of information uh, is wide open. It's kind of like drinking through a fire hose. So uh, it's one of the reasons why I think putting those experiences into our earthly language, mm-hmm. which is very good for describing a trip to Disney World, uh, mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily suit those kind of journeys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's one reason I love talking with other near-death experiencers, mm-hmm. for example, like at the IONS meeting, uh, is just that so much more of the communication occurs mm-hmm. than just the words. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is kind of heartfelt, emotional, uh, kind of empathy, uh, resonance of mm-hmm. information. Um, so it's really just a much broader and bigger category of communication mm-hmm. than we're used to. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Karen Newell and I in our most recent book, Living in a Mindful Universe, go into 
deep detail about meditation and about sound enhanced meditation. Because we figure everyone can get there as a mm -hmm. conscious being. Mm -hmm. And that's really, the answers lie within us all. So that's really the best uh, teacher. Mm. And I heard someone say once, it's almost like you have eyes on every part of your head and up and down and around and in the back. Yeah, it? and it and it's so much beyond that. I mean, yeah. but again, this uh, the fact that your attention can can uh, uh, basically encompass this huge field mm -hmm. of information, and and we're used to having very kind of limited bandwidth in this mm -hmm. material realm. You know, what mm -hmm. we can pay attention to in any one moment in our stream of consciousness is very limited. Uh, but in those realms, it's wide open. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's where creativity and so much other insight and guidance can come through, too. And that's why meditation is so valuable. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, I thought, as you were talking about the idea of... Um, like being more dreamlike here than there. I wondered, is it because there you're in the present moment 100% and here, do you find that that was part of it is you're like, here we're thinking of a million things at the well, same plus, time. And also it's that bandwidth thing. It's the, yeah. you know, because it's not only the eyes and ears that are kind of focusing our awareness, but the brain plays a huge role in shrinking it all way down right. to this tiny little kind of illusion of a here now and a sense of self. Right. Whereas in those realms, we have far broader modes of knowing that can include many other beings at once. Mm -hmm. For example, the life review that's often talked mm -hmm. about in near-death experience. You go through that uh, not as your own self, but you feel the emotional power of your actions and thoughts on other around you mm -hmm. throughout your entire lifetime. Wow. And and so it's this much broader you know sense of self. Self yeah. becomes far grander wow. when it includes so much more. Uh, including other beings, uh, every being ever impacted by choices that we make in life. So um, it's just extraordinary and certainly not expected. It's the exact opposite of what materialist science would try and postulate is there as the brain is shutting down. Because mm -hmm. the brain is really a filter, uh, mm -hmm. and it also is very limiting. And so as the brain goes away, it's basically like being released from a prison, mm -hmm. and you're out in the, the real world, mm -hmm. uh, which of course, uh, again, can be uh, a skill gleaned from deep meditation. I'm convinced that no one has to have an NDE. You don't mm -hmm. have to be smoked down by meningitis or hit by a truck mm -hmm. to get all of this. As a mm -hmm. conscious, sentient being, we can all practice going within our consciousness and exploring it. Uh, and that's where we get so many uh, kind of answers and insights and kind of connecting the dots in our lives. Uh, and I would say that really the the biggest message that comes out of near-death experiences is not that our consciousness exists beyond the death of the brain and body, but it's much more about how to live this life. Mm -hmm. uh, this life is why we exist, uh, and those brilliant ultra-real periods between lives are only there as kind of a stepping stone to then come back in and do it again. Mm -hmm. Always improving, always building towards that oneness with the divine, but through multiple incarnations, which is something I never appreciated, of course, before my coma. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the genuine, um, the genuine spiritual self in the book and how what you felt there, how do you feel it here? And so you're saying meditation is one way to connect into that. It, it is. And, and for ways? me, I've, I've tremendously developed... Um, relationships with my uh, the realms I visited first, my NDE, through meditation. Uh, and for me, that's very specifically a sound-enhanced uh, version, sacred acoustics, uh, uh, you know, Karen Newell's work. And, and that's a crucial part of, of that exploring within and discovery. But uh, my knowledge of those realms is far beyond what it was after my NDE because of the meditation. Uh, but the, the real key here, again, is focusing on the life we're to lead here. Right. So in other words, those meditative experiences are not just to blank the mind and take a break. They're actually mm -hmm. to engage wisdom, to engage our higher soul and soul groups and that uh, force of universal love that is uh, infinitely healing and, and bring all that to action in this life. Right. So the meditation is is really just a step towards guidance and knowing and then applying a lot of that wisdom that we gain in those realms um, to how we act here and what we do. When I that was something when I teach meditation for me, I it's the opposite of 
had no thought. It, it's like it, the thoughts all condense down into like a linear line and become an experience. And and I could tell you what I experience, but the meaning behind them comes, and it that's the whole lesson. Right. Right. It's totally different than any other meditation that I people imagine, but mine I am experiencing in my meditation for sure. Yeah. Well, I think that's a huge part of it. Karen and I often talk about that in our meditation play shops. Is it's almost like uh, we. You know, I, I visualize this entire existence as being a set of milestones or stepping stones, which are really the hardships and difficulties and challenges. But we lay those out in our lives, and then we come and live through them. And it's how we deal with those challenges and difficulties, recovering love and oneness and, and all of that, that helps us to truly grow into this. So it's all about growing as souls becoming much more of who we came here to be. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an interesting kind of dance between a notion of free will, mm -hmm. but also a notion that some of that is predestined, that we picked those hardships and difficulties, our mm -hmm. higher soul mm -hmm. and our soul group before this incarnation. But then it's we're given the option of free will choices and how we manage them mm -hmm. in going through this life. And the more we can uh, stick closely to a compass that is one of making all of our choices out of love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, and mercy, then we come much closer to that direct uh, ascendance towards that oneness with the divine. Uh, but we have the free will to choose otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said in Proof of Heaven you can do no wrong. But what that really means is uh, it's a way of learning the lessons of loving this world. Uh, and that greed and selfishness and hurting people uh, we're, we're only hurting ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what this kind of soul school environment provides, is the ability to learn that as we go. And that's why that life review, which of course is not a new age concept, the life flashing before your eyes goes back at least to the time of Plato, mm -hmm. 2,400 years ago. Uh, but it's all about uh, living that life and, and living one that is really full of love for all, given that one mind is, is doing this dream and we're all part of that, uh, that wonderful dream. I think a lot of times when we work with clients, there is a lot of regret. You know, whatever they've done that they feel is wrong, they can't forgive themselves, they can't forgive other people. And so just that notion that there's nothing you could do wrong, there's only choices you could make to learn, that relieves a lot of stress. Of I think it does. <laughs> and, and, of course, remembering that um, it's we're bound together in that realm through love. I mean, that's what near-death experiencers, no matter what their background, yeah. I don't care if it's a prison population, murderers and rapists, what they go through in that transition, the deathbed visions, the kind of experiences all of us have, really point towards that love. And that's why in that setting, you can recognize places of kind of hatred and violence uh, in your life as being uh, major points of learning. Uh, mm -hmm. that it really is directing all of humanity onto a pathway of, of love and compassion and mercy for all fellow beings. That's what near-death experiences bring back. And that's kind of the empirical ground uh, that, for me, defines that kind of life review in the proper setting for our lives uh, and defines that appropriate course as one of love and compassion and kindness. Mm -hmm. And I, a quote I heard recently, I, I think it could have been Mother Teresa, but said that compassion is not complete unless it includes compassion for yourself. Absolutely. And so in that life review, did you feel that compassion even for yourself and what you, understanding the choices you made or why you did things? Well, you know, my whole journey, and I'm still wrestling with this, I'm not saying that my NDE has got me to any end point, uh, has really been one of being worthy of love. You know, I point that out in, in a proof of heaven. Uh, for me, that struggle started with uh, being put up for adoption when I was 11 days old. Uh, and so really, that that is kind of my, my baby wound, as, as Karen uh, puts it. Um, and we all have a baby wound. We all have uh, some sense of a detachment from source coming into these material bodies. Uh, uh, and, and that's where we are to learn and grow is through every bit of that. But uh, certainly learning that love and being worthy of love is something that my near-death experience helped me with a lot. Um, but I've still, even over the last decade of, of making sense of it all, um, you know, I'm still working with that. And, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's a beautiful lesson. It's something I do in meditation all the time, but it's really recovering that love of the divine within. And I think that's kind of universal. 
Yeah. That's what this is about for all of us, is to mm -hmm. awaken to that, to know that we've never been separate from that loving source. Never have been. Our very conscious awareness is the, the flowering of that love of the universe for the creation. And that's why recovering that and then bringing that love for self is absolutely crucial. And I would say Karen was instrumental in my learning of that lesson, uh, teaching me to become much more than just actively loving and uh, loving in thought, uh, even loving emotionally to a point of becoming the love, uh, mm -hmm. which of course is that pure form that so many near-death experiencers have witnessed. Uh, but then can you bring that back to this world? And for a long time I thought, I don't know if you can bring it back. But Karen had been meditating, uh, going into these spaces for her uh, whole life in many ways. And she's the one who proved to me very strongly that yes, of course, you can bring that love deeply into this world. And that's what I think we're all here to do. But that's the best way to love self, is through serving as a conduit for that love. When you realize we're all part of one mind, mm -hmm. uh, then all of that starts to make sense. Wow, that's amazing. In that book as well, um, one of the things I liked is, is all as well, the concept of all as well. Expand on that for me. That, that is probably one of the most essential points of it all. And that's something uh, I've certainly come to know in meditation. Uh, if, if at any point I'm not sensing that all is well, I just don't have a big enough perspective. Mm. And so in meditation, I can broaden my perspective tremendously, yeah. come to realize that all beings involved in any kind of interaction I'm having with the world uh, can be encompassed in a win-win situation where love from the heart is there for all involved. Mm. And so whenever I can uh, adopt that particular perspective with any concrete issue I'm dealing with in interpersonal relationships or what have you, I know that I'm getting to the right point because all is well uh, is really an acknowledgement that the hardships and difficulties are here for a reason mm -hmm. and that we have ways of managing those and learning from them and using them as stepping stones of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all is well for me in so many ways says it all. Yeah. Uh, it's often what I put when I sign uh, the book Proof of Heaven to people. I often put all as well as my little uh, kind of address to people because th to me that says so, so much. And in meditation, it's kind of a measure of mm -hmm. uh, how balanced I am. Uh, if I can really see that in any situation, all is well. I had an experience with the divine. I, I felt the feminine and the masculine divine, and that's their whole message was that was just it. I wrote it in my phone. Today I received a blessing from my heavenly parents, all is well. That's all what it says. That is beautiful. And all is well is just another way of saying that all the dualisms yeah. come into balance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I love the, the display of signs out in front of uh, yeah. that building next door <laughs> yeah. of all the, the, the double yes. words. where yes. they're, they're And they're often opposites, but sometimes a paradox of playing uh, dualisms against each other, yes. good, bad black, white, red, blue, masculine, feminine, um, because really that oneness and that all as well is an acknowledgement that all dualisms originate in the one mind, the one universe. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course all is well. Uh, it's one of the, the kind of problems of our current society is that everybody thinks you got to be red or blue. Right. You know, everybody's going for the poles, whereas yeah. the real answer lies in the middle with this beautiful uh, resonance and, and this, especially with Facebook and other social media, going for clickbait, pushing us towards what we want to see, that stretches this polarization, yeah. which leads to a lot of tension. Yeah. But uh, masculine and feminine is a beautiful example, as Karen uh, points out often, uh, uh, you know, all of us contain masculine and feminine energy. Yeah. So what we're really talking about is a balancing of energies. And that's what is what will make our society far, far healthier, mm -hmm. is to realize that we can always get a balance of these dualities, of these polarizations, and get something that's much more kind of resonant uh, and harmonious with, with that oneness of, uh, of love. Mm -hmm. so. That's the only way to have Oneness is if you have both ends of the duality contained it's within. in one spot. Exactly. That's well, that's kind of the notion of all yeah. is well, and yeah. that the perspective is correct. If I'm seeing, okay, all is well, mm -hmm. I'm now seeing that balance. I see how we can achieve all the goals. Yeah. So, so if you have an interaction with somebody and it's bothered you, then your next your next meditation will be on expanding that perspective. And right. That's what you'll and do. and also uh, you know acknowledging the gift of that challenge because right. the challenge is what presents you with the opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. 
right. so for me, it's always acknowledging, thanking. Uh, you know, I, I remember after my NDE coming to realize that uh, some people who I had fought before my coma were my nemesis or, you know, in my way of getting something that I was striving for, came to realize that they were near and dear soul mates who were just helping me to learn a tough lesson. Mm -hmm. and, and we're all really in this together. And the more mm -hmm. we can see that broader perspective, uh, the more it really helps us all to help each other up, right. uh, you know, in our growth. Right. One of the statements that really stood out in your book, you said after you're meeting your biological family that you felt a wholeness you had never known before. And wholeness is a word that we love. We are the Wholeness Network. That's what we're promoting mm -hmm. uh, and discussing a lot. So we just wanted to know, what does wholeness mean to you? Well, I would point to, uh, you know, healing, wholeness, health. They all come from the, the same kind of root of becoming whole, mm -hmm. becoming all that we are here to be. So in essence, all of us are in a process of healing by being incarnate in these physical forms because we are becoming the soul we came to this, uh, this world to be. And uh, for me, that, you know, meeting my birth family filled in a lot of blanks. It was just a beautiful gift in, in giving me more kind of, a, of that bigger uh, helicopter view of who I am, who I came here to be. And so really meeting them was uh, something that helped me a lot. Uh, but um, as with most things in life, uh, I'm not there yet. You know, that whole meeting, uh, in many ways, what's transpired over the last 10 years, leaves me still with uh, uh, kind of a, a challenge in terms of being worthy of love. So I'm mm -hmm. still in the process of, of discovering and growing and healing into that wholeness of self. I'm not there yet. Yeah. Well, wholeness is a process. That's what we've been <laughs> talking about, that it's the state of becoming whole. You're continually in that state of right. becoming whole. It's a new Absolutely. wholeness at right. every moment. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. And I, I, I actually don't believe that we ever get to any kind of complete wholeness in one lifetime or in yeah. any number of lifetimes. Although human beings definitely can ascend much more towards a oneness with the divine, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is the goal of all of this. I mm -hmm. think that's why we're here. The three messages that you shared um, that I just kept writing down over and over, you are loved and cherished, you have nothing to fear, and there's nothing you can do wrong. They're, they're so filled with hope and so filled with um, purpose about our life. And so I was thinking, what about people who never get to find that wholeness? They never get to meet their birth family or, you know, how would they find that wholeness anyway? And I feel like these messages answer that. These messages I think that's very true. A lot and, of and that's that. what's so important is uh, uh, you really can't do it wrong, although you can take a longer, more arduous pathway. Um, but really it's about recovering love for self and others. And it's the love of the universe for the creation. Uh, in essence, we are all uh, godlike or identified with that creative force. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as we come to realize that it's all about love and, and compassion and mercy, then that's all we really need to know. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the discovery comes from how we live these lives, manifesting those truths. I love that. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much well, for your time. We appreciate you coming, and I, I will definitely get my book signed. I know. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. His there. book, The Proof of Heaven, that's the cover, so this is <laughs> yeah. gone. Yeah, here's, here's a, a more modified version. <laughs> what your book will look like after you read it. <laughs> and then you have the Living in a Mindful you Universe. Can, yeah. We should show yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that. this, this is our ambitious attempt to unite science and spirituality. Wow. Uh, and it really goes deep. Uh, and it's about a scientific revolution that's inevitable. It's happening now mm -hmm. all around consciousness. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I appreciate thank you it. so much. and growth at thewholenessnetwork.com.